Hello, welcome to Big Bang Radio Spotlights. This is a show where we talk to independent artists from all around the world all about their music and their process for making it. I'm your host, Isaac Anderson, and today I get to sit down with Cameron Liu from the band Ginger Root. Without any further ado, here's the interview. Cameron, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I've been very excited to talk to you because I'm a big fan of your music, and we're going to touch on a lot of things in your musical endeavors in just a bit, but I like to start at the beginning at, uh, of your musical journey whenever we start talking to uh, different artists here. So what is your earliest musical memory? Yeah, sure. Um, I remember going to my aunt's house when I was uh, a very young wee lad, maybe like five or something and she had a piano and I was I was always like poking around on it and stuff that was like my earliest musical memory but I think it really started um, when I was around uh, 10 years old my parents got me a guitar for Christmas not because I asked for one but because they're like here's something to do and I was like okay great <laughs> and it, um it came with like a dvd on like how to play a g chord and how to play the 12 bar blues and I went through all the lessons and I finished them and I was like hey I finished guitar i think and they're like do you want to keep going and i'm like sure so I, I took lessons and then um when i was in high school there was an after school program that i can only describe as basically school of rock we would like learn how to cover like the beatles and cover like electric like orchestra and that's where i started to learn how to play bass and keyboards and record my own songs and um in high school i started writing music um and you know terrible songs at the time and then um I just uh, started picking up more instruments and getting more familiar with recording, and I really found myself enjoying that process. Um, and then I started, you know, playing in other people's bands, backing other people up. Um, I had a couple other bands before Ginger Root, and then um, how Ginger Root came about is that I um, I was writing a bunch of songs that I was that didn't really fit the band I was in at the time, so I just started writing you know, under a new name, just because I had all these songs that uh, that band, like it wouldn't make sense to play those songs with them. And then um, kind of from there, I just started writing more and more. And then eventually some of my friends were like, hey, you should like maybe do like a full record with Ginger Root or something. And then I was like, okay. And then and then I just started making music under this name and then uh, the, the rest is from there. So. So I imagine, I know you've covered this in quite a couple of interviews because um, watching, uh, watching a couple of the people talk to you, you explain uh, the Ginger Root name comes from um, Jack from Volpec and he's, uh, does yeah. he says Ginger Root and you're watching it at like 4 a.m. or something like that. For, for, those, that, for yeah. those that don't, uh, don't know, um, I, I don't want to make you retread the story or anything, but like was Ginger Root <laughs> the only name that you had in mind? Was there any alternate titles? And like how do you feel about that name like all, all this many... Uh, many years later um it, it's kind of funny it's like maybe low-key embarrassing because I, I think like at that time ginger root was just uh, a i just needed a name for like these five songs i wrote and like because i was so infatuated with this one like speech by jack stratton of wolfpeck like at four in the morning it's the only thing i could think about and like i think i was like tagging the demos in my iTunes library and I was like I just need a name and I was like well Ginger it's pretty funny um and I think it I think it's kind of interesting that like now people have come up to me and be like oh Ginger because it's like refreshing and like it's an herb and it's like a tea and it's healing and your music's healing and I'm like oh okay I yeah it's actually because I just watched a funny video about Jack ranting about Instacart and Ginger but um, but yeah, I don't know. I, the, the name kind of stuck and I think, uh, now it's, it's here to stay. Um, but yeah. <laughs> your sound as aggressive elevator soul and that's quite uh that, that's quite a description and i i really dig that sound it's not a sound i hear a whole lot because uh, seeing you guys play live sets and everything there's there's no guitar I, i'm even though you can play guitar you mostly stick on the keyboard the whole time i, I imagine that throws some people off when, especially when you play in california and stuff like there's no guitar like <laughs> yeah absolutely but it, to it totally works. But uh, do you did you go into this project kind of knowing you wanted that project to sound like that? Or was it just like, this is just the kind of music that I'm going to make, these are the instruments I'm going to play, whatever it comes out as is what Ginger Root is going to be? 
Um, I think quite honestly, at the beginning, I was writing stuff because, uh, like I said earlier, it was, it was songs that really didn't fit this band I was I was in at the time, and that band was on um, like guitar based music, and I think I was just trying to write something that was really out of my comfort zone. It was more keyboard based and more more rhythm based and um, at that time, I was like getting really back into soul music and stuff. So I wanted to write something a little bit more, you know, groove oriented, soul oriented and stuff. And I think, you know, and I think this, like with all artists, I think Ginger Root is still trying to find exactly what they're supposed to sound like and what the, and what I, I feel comfortable writing. But I do, I will say, I think Ricky is the, is definitely a step closer to how I feel I want Ginger Root to sound like. And it's, it's an ever going process. And, it's always influenced by, you know, what you're listening to at the time and, and stuff, definitely. But I think it's, um, it's been a self-discovery kind of ish journey, you know, writing all this music you know, from the start of Ginger and, until now. Heard that, heard that. Well, you mentioned before that you went to film school and you actually work in that industry today. You work as a, as a film editor uh, alongside with playing music. How do you think mm-hmm. your film background and uh, film school experiences kind of influence the way you play your music? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I went to Chapman University. I uh, was a film major, and I emphasized in, I emphasized in editing. Um, and I think specifically as an editor, um, as a freelance editor, because that's still what I do on the side. Is um, there's a certain rhythm that I learned with editing, and I think like being a musician and then coming and then also being an editor at the same time. You know, both the rhythms of filmmaking and music kind of transfer and influence both like when I'm editing or and then when I'm edit- when I'm making music the editor and the filmmaking background kind of kicks in here and there and so I definitely think the the cadence and the pacing of of film has definitely and probably subconsciously you know influenced the way I write music and, and definitely produce music and also totally like when it comes to directing the music videos for Ginger Root that definitely obviously has an influence too so I definitely think um just like filmmaking and music go hand in hand and, and, you know, we know that with like scoring and, and, you know, and everything too. And so I think definitely um, that's how they kind of uh, interconnect. What, what would made you kind of switch? You're like, okay, I want to, I really want to go to this music thing. Or was it just like, well, I'm going to go to school for film and I'm, I'm, I'm music's really what I want to do, but I'm just going to get this thing as kind of like a backup thing or was it vice versa? Um, uh, to be honest, when I, when I was in the school and, and, and some people, who listen to it, who are going through school or has gone through school might have, have filled me on this, but I think my, my, my love for filmmaking kind of got, um, kind of got squashed just by like film becoming so academic in school and being graded on projects in film school for anyone who's gone through film school. is just like just a ball of stress for like four years. Um, so I think I found myself using music as just a way to, kind of relieve some of that stress and get away from film school in a way. And, and that's not to say that I, I don't love film anymore. I think there's definitely, it's just, there's, there's this thing that happened in school where, you know, I, I kind of got tired of it and I got burnt out and I think I just leaned more heavily into music. And, um, and I think it was a great thing to do to keep my mind off of, you know, the stress of school and and film school and everything. And so I think when I was, you know, making like the the records and recording and writing new songs and trying to play live, you know, locally and stuff um, like those first couple gigs. I think that was really just just super fun because it was like all new and it was something that I wasn't graded on and it was something that I can do on my own time and at my own will. And so, um, yeah. Heard that, heard that. Well, while you were in school, you actually made a cover series on YouTube called Toaster Music V2, <laughs> I believe. And if you haven't seen this, anybody that's watching this, it's basically you doing soul covers, and it's very fun editing. It reminds me a lot of Volpec editing, and it's you playing on this tiny drum set in the back of your, I think it's a your Honda Element, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get any strong reactions from people, like, walking down the street, and, like, is there, like, a boom, boom, to tap going in this, like, in this <laughs> van thing? Or, like, did you ever get some hard stares? Because, like, you're out in public doing a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah. I, I did get some stares. Um, definitely didn't get, well, so the funny thing is, is that the, the first two I did, well, the first one I was, the first the whole thing I was like, oh, I'm going to try to make an original song like every week for like the whole semester. And I was like, that's way too difficult. So let me just do covers because that's like way easier. But the second week I did it on the roof of like the digital arts building at Chapman and like halfway through the take, like the cops pull up because I guess I, someone called or there was a camera and 
rightfully so because like I had wires coming out of my you know car because I had all these cables and I was miking up. But like it was interesting that they didn't see me playing guitar. So um, and like I, I have a parking pass. I'm obviously a student. But like they came up and like parked right behind me and they were just like chilling there. And so like right when I finished the take, I was like, well, I'm just gonna pack up and call it a day. <laughs> and then I ended up driving into the basement floor in like the cor- the utmost corner and like lightly tapping my like drums that I like brought with me. Cause I was like, I gotta finish this. I gotta, you know, whatever. But yeah, some looks here and there. Um, some people like jogging would like ruin the take cause they would be like, oh, sorry, like really loud and you know, stuff like that. Um, but definitely a lot of stairs, you know, people, children playing in the parking lot being like, mom, what is that kid doing? And I'm like, I don't even know myself kid. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite cover that you did in that series? Oh, man, favorite cover. Um, I think the one that the cops rolled up, which is the second one, I think is my favorite because that really was like a spur of the moment thing. And I'm glad like I didn't mess up that take. And it was the first one. So I kind of didn't really know that I was going to do one every week and actually follow through with the project. Um, I think that one's pretty special and will always be a special one. The other one is probably the wichita lineman cover because that that song is uh, by glenn campbell it's just it has a it's a very there's a very special place in my heart for that song so yeah heard that heard that man well um kind of hopping on to your original music right now so as we mentioned before yeah. you do a lot of this stuff kinda, i imagine you're in where you record right now right um i did some of it yes uh, actually in my bedroom and then recently i moved into a, a small like like studio space that I'm trying to rent out. And so, um, yeah, just like a DIY studio, you know, out of there. Heard that, heard that. Well, uh, you have some really awesome kind of grooves and feel in your music. Uh, what, what exactly is your tracking process like? Because you're doing a lot of the stuff yourself. You're doing pr- pretty much all of it yourself. H- how exactly do you go about tackling everything? Um, uh, originally, you know, when I'm writing music, it, it starts as like as a voice memo, just probably on keyboards and vocals or, uh, a guitar progression or something. And then I'll usually, you know, make a scratch track, um, in the logic and just try to get it, you know, as, um, flush out as possible, just one track. And then I'll, I'll play drums to that. Um, and then I'll just build from there. And, and it's usually keys first with the scratch track, then drums, and then a bass line, mainly because when we play live, there's only three of us. Um, and so I want to make sure that the song kind of works with just those three fundamental instruments because that's what we'll be playing live. And then from there, I kind of take out stuff and bring in stuff. And I, you know, I try some synth stuff out. And then I usually vocals are the last thing, um, just because um, I I started primarily as a musician. So just instrumentally, things are um, kind of more of a priority than vocals. And then um, and then usually I'll finish that demo. I'll listen to it a couple times, like throughout the week, and try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And then usually I'll end up actually just just basically taking that demo and re-recording the whole thing, but like better performance because I kind of now am committing to the parts and, you know, I've heard how they are supposed to live and I, I take those and I basically put them into stone and I, I, I try to play them better and I, then I do the whole mic placement and like getting a good sound. So yeah, it starts as a voice memo, then goes into a demo and I kind of swim in that demo for a little bit and then see what kind of needs to be there and what kind of doesn't. And then I, take it and I record it just all myself, just going to the computer, to the drums, to the synth, to the whatever, and, and yeah, taking it one step at a time. Heard that, heard that. But when it comes to lyrics, do you tend to write more from like an experiential standpoint? I, I feel like a lot of your stuff is very, uh, very narrative, and I think that goes back to your film background, but I don't know. How, how do you go about writing your lyrics like that? Um, I think lyrically, um, it tends to be very uh, lately, especially Ricky, it, it's very, it's predominantly introspective, um, just with feelings I have about, um, h- how I'm doing, you know, maybe mentally or close friends that I see how they're, how they're doing in, in their life and everything. Um, I, I've tried writing like, as like a story in terms of like, you know, there was a guy, but I, that I know a lot of people are really good at that, but I just don't think that's my forte. So I tend to write just kind of just what I'm feeling at the moment. So yeah, very introspective, very personal in terms of, you know, um, how, how it's going really. Heard that, heard that. Well, this is it, time to get a little bit nerdy because I mentioned to you before, uh, I'm, yes. I'm also really big into recording and, um, I, I, 
I really love the way your music sounds mix-wise, and I lo specifically your vocal you. chain is really, really cool because it seems like you have this kind of thing where it's kind of like this kind of low mid thing, but it's got like this kind of little presence right up here. And the like. And anybody that doesn't know any mixing that thinks I'm talking rock and science right now, but anybody that does, <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, I want to know this too. So, and also I know you did a video for Good Hertz, which is uh, also uh, uh, an independent um, plug-in company that um, yeah. Jack Stratton from Volpec actually has the Wolf compressor. And I yeah. feel like you use a lot of that in your music. I can hear, I can hear a lot of it. Um, so if you had to choose three plugins, Desert Island plugins, yeah. if like I had to make a song just using these three plugins to mix with, what would yeah. you use? Okay, it'd be uh, number one, it'd be the Good Hertz Wolf compressor, number one. That's bread and butter. Two is um, the Waves REDD17. It's like a uh, channel strip. It's like a console channel strip for saturation and a little bit of EQ. Um, and then my third one would honestly straight up be the built-in log logic compressor, like no shame, like mainly because I'm, maybe that's cheating because it's like seven compressor models. So you could like choose different compressors, but it's basically the same thing. So it's the, it's two compressors and then that channel strip, which is like a little bit of EQ and saturation. Kind of, kind of hopping back into uh, the music side of things. Well, this is more on, uh, on the marketing side too, because you're not only uh, a talented musician uh, and filmmaker, you're also a very talented uh, marketer too. And um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, from from what I understand, um, you were playing some shows around, and the shows were not uh, s selling as well as you wanted to. So you made some targeted uh, Instagram ads about like what would happen yeah. if they didn't come to a ginger root so uh, ginger root show. Um, yeah. So what was, uh, like, was that like just an off-the-cuff thing that's like, let's just go do this, I'm going to spend, you know, five bucks a day on this thing? And, like, what was your favorite ad that you ever made that really got a good reaction? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so I did basically this whole, it was very, to answer your question, yeah, it was very spontaneous because I was talking to um, my tour manager and he was just like, like, we need to try to figure out how to, you know, do these shows and this is like our first like you know kind of head, uh, headlining tour and it was still kind of half diy half you know whatever and um i was like okay i'm just gonna make i think this is like where my film school kid like or film school brain like kicked in and i was like i'm gonna make this really like stupid like like uh thing where i'm gonna pretend to be a guy that went to a ginger root show and i'm just gonna like be telling basically fake testimonials about like what it would be like if you actually came to this show and um, and so I made one for like, I'm all, like all the big cities that were hitting, uh, Atlanta, Nashville and, um, New York and stuff like that. Well, my friend studied architecture at NYU and uh, after she graduated, she moved out of Manhattan to this tiny closet in Brooklyn and I was visiting, I just got off the plane and she greeted me and she goes, hey, I just bought you and I tickets to go see this show tonight and I was like, I just got off a five hour flight, like what makes you think I want to go see a show tonight? And she was like, come on, like it's only 4 p.m. in California anyway, so you have no excuse and you know, I gave in and I was like, fine, so we went and it was Ginger Root at Elsewhere. That and um, just kind of had fun with it, like trying to create these like fake narratives about these false Ginger Root fans or people who weren't going to go to a Ginger Root show, but then they ended up like getting taken by their friend and they're like, oh, I really like this band called Ginger Root. But um, I think I think those ads, I think probably were my favorite kind of, you know, making. And it's funny because I don't really, I've never viewed them as ads. I kind of just view them as like videos just to, sh to make or whatever. And so when people are like, oh man, your commercials and your marketing is really great. I'm like, oh, yes, that is something I do, too. It's like something that I really don't think about a lot. I'm just like, oh, I'm going to make this. Like today, I'm probably going to make a video apologizing for the vinyl being delayed because of COVID. And I'm going to make it a press conference and stuff. And just because, like, you know, it's it's fun. I, I like doing those. I know a lot of musicians, the social media aspect is kind of a chore. And they have to, like, ah, they got to create a brand. But I just do it because I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. And I don't really put a whole lot of thought into it. <laughs> kind of sticking on videos you sir have some of the coolest music videos that i've ever seen um <laughs> i'm a big fan of uh, the karaoke music video too by the way i put that on a spotify playlist i listen to pretty much every day now so i um i, I hear that all, <laughs> the, uh, all the time yeah no problem but that music video is um was my first introduction to you is what uh, is where one of our producers oh, right on the station um sent that and it really really impressed me how like how like how the style was and like 
how funny it was and like how good the song was. Everything kind of melded together with it. And from what I understand, you do all those videos yourself. Like you direct them and edit them too, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I have um, mainly the people that I went to film school with. Like I, I have my uh, go-to production designer and cinematographer. But for editing and directing, uh, yes, it's all um, in-house. <laughs> That's really, really good. They look great. Uh, they're, they're very well shot and they're very well put together. When you go into each of your music videos, do you have an idea of uh, the kind of music video you want to make? Or do you just kind of say, well, let's just go out, let's shoot some stuff that we think is fun, and let's kind of piece it together and find the narrative later? Um, it's definitely, I'll, I'll definitely be listening, usually like when I'm writing the song and I'm like in the mixing phase because, you know, I'm hearing it a bunch of times, slowly ideas for videos will kind of surface and I'll usually write them down and, you know, there'll be a couple and then uh, they usually kind of grow organically, like just like kind of while I'm doing other things and be like, oh, it'd be really funny if I sang karaoke in an office and then days will go by. I'm like, oh, it'd be really funny if like, like, like Dylan, my bass player is like the boss and I'm trying to like impress him and then like days go by and I'm like, oh, it'd be really funny if like, you know, this happened to the video and like Matt was giving me tutorial. So it's like kind of like this process. But I think like, again, like coming from a film background, background, like I'll do pre-production and I'll make sure that there's a shot list because I know I've been on sets where people are just like, let's just shoot something. And that just ends up going terrible because no one knows what's going on. And and I, I don't want to waste anybody's time because I, you know, I appreciate like my friends helping me and. You know, because music videos, they cost money and I, you know, and I want to make sure that, you know, um, everything runs smoothly and, and people are happy and because these are all my friends and I want to have a good time. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of pre-production, a lot of um, uh, like uh, um, shot listing and location scouting and, you know, scheduling too. And then, um, yeah, we'll go there, we'll shoot it and hopefully it'll run the smoothest. I mean, every video has had some type of train wreck that has kind of had to been overcome and usually that's how the video kind of ends up and that's why it ends up and actually that's kind of a thing that people expect from a junior they're like all right this is how it's probably going to turn out or what you expect but there's something probably that's going to go wrong on set that we'll have to try to figure out on the fly and um but yeah but at the end of the day like those videos like are just a, a lot of fun a lot of stress goes into them and i probably lose a couple years off my life every time i do one but at the end of the day seeing the finished product is, is very is very rewarding i think Heard that, heard that. Well, they're, they're, a lot, they're a lot of fun. There's lots of them for people to, for to look at on uh, social media. And specifically, there's a lot for uh, your, new, uh, your new album, which we mentioned earlier, Ricky, uh, which was released yes. a couple weeks ago. And um, it's really awesome stuff. It's got a really cool sound to it. I love the cover of it. Too. It's like the sword and uh, the you. little cloth. And I love your photo too of like you kind of like making the face with the microphone and like you yeah. doing the karate pose. Um, yeah. Like when, when you went in there, like uh, like that color scheme for the album, like it's such like a bright red and looks like it's got like this film grain on it too. It's really, really cool. Um, yeah. Like um, what, what, what was kind of like um, the behind the choice of, of putting that on there? Was it like something that you had in your mind um for a while, that album cover, or is it like, hey, I, I feel like maybe this color would be really cool and popping, and I have the sword. Uh, I, I don't know how how exactly that come to be. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I don't I don't think I've ever answered a question about the album cover. My uh, the photographer, uh, my friend uh, Lauren Kim, um, I contacted her, and I know that I wanted to do something um, martial arts based because there's as I was writing the record, I kind of figured out that I wanted the record to have a theme of of like nostalgia and memories and, you know, and um, uh, remembering, you know, events that happened in the past personally. And so martial arts was a big part of my life when I was, a, when I was a kid. And so I definitely wanted to do something like that. But mainly I think the main inspiration was I was looking at old photos of like Jackie Chan, like old press photos from like the eighties and, and even like um, a lot of uh, like Asian music album covers, like from the eighties, like from China and from Japan and, they all had this very distinct, like vivid, and even like like Levi's ads from the the seventies and stuff like that, and even eighties and car ads from the eighties, Volkswagen stuff. And there is this, there's a certain charm that I really wanted to try to. So I, I sent a bunch of like stuff to Lauren, and I was like, hey, I, this is like kind of the look I want to do, and she was like, yeah, let's like absolutely try to do that. And so um, yeah, one day we kind of just took a bunch of photos, and I. I found the sword. That's like the sword I used to train with when I did martial arts when I was like, you know, uh, a wee lad again. Um, and so, yeah, and I was, we were originally the back cover of the record of me doing the pose was going to be the front, but I always feel uncomfortable being like on the front cover of things. So I think it was one of the last photos we took where I just put the sword on the floor and I kind of like, 
through the flag that's attached to the sword in a certain way. And I was like, hey, can you just take a picture like directly above it? And she was like, yeah. And then when she got it back, we both were like, that'd be really cool to the cover. And then I'm like, absolutely. So it was like half planned and then half spontaneous. But I think all that planning needed to happen to realize that just the sword on the ground or the like the photo background, that red background. And I think like red has always been a color in terms of your question about the color, I think has always been a ginger color. The last record, Mahjong Room, like the keyboard's red and, you know, red is a, a, a very lucky color in Chinese culture, which is um, something that I'm trying to bring forth in kind of the aesthetic of ginger too. And um, so, yeah, all, all those things kind of played into, I think, um, going into what the cover is. Heard that, heard that. Well, it's definitely an awesome looking cover, cool looking photos. Um, and, and just, a, it really kind of drives home, like you said, the sound of that record. Uh, what was the process of recording that like? Were these songs that like you kind of had as a collective and saying, oh, these songs, I really want to put all these things together. Uh, or was it like, these are the best songs I've come up with recently? Or like, were they songs you've sent them for a long time? I don't, I don't know. How was it uh, making this record? Yeah, it was kind of half and half in terms of, I, I was writing songs um, I, I think like uh, all the songs on Ricky, there might have been maybe one or two that didn't make the cut. Um, so I did have to choose uh, between a couple. But I think as a whole, the songs were being written. And I think maybe halfway I realized, because they were written a little more closely together than, than the previous record, Mahjong Room, I think I figured that, okay, I, there's this certain common theme in terms of sound and tonality and even lyrically. And I think you know, after writing four songs, I, I kind of dove into that. And I think, oh, I think the album should maybe continue this this theme of, you know, this musical theme, this this sonic theme and, and this lyrical theme. And, and from there, then I start maybe consciously writing a little bit more um, with kind of those overarching ideas um, as a whole. So it was kind of half serendipitous and then half like intentional. I think halfway through, I kind of found my footing. I've never been able to write an album just from the get-go, like, all right, this album's going to be about space. And then it just, it just happens. I think, like, I just, I kind of write a bunch of songs and then kind of see, like, oh, there's some things going on here. Um, and I think I'll maybe just kind of chase that and go for that. So, yeah. Heard that, heard that. Well, it's on streaming platforms right now. Uh, if anybody wants to listen to it, um, and I think you have something on your YouTube channel where it's the whole album uh, from front to back right there. It's got the album cover up there. People can listen to it on YouTube if they don't have streaming. But what, what's next What's next for you, man? Do you have anything kind of coming down the pipe? I know this record just came out, and we really yeah. can't tour because of COVID. Um, but uh, do, what, what, do you have anything planned, like live streams, doing anything new? <sighs> Um, well, to be honest, that's something that, well, I think every musician right now is trying to figure out in terms of, you know, you normally you put out a record and then you're gone for the next half year and you're trying to figure out, and then you're trying to figure out time to write the next record. So I think like, yeah, it's been something, you know, there's not really anything that's coming up. I think, you know, all I can hope for is people find the record and I'm always writing new music. And I think what's interest an interesting thing that maybe I'm trying to think about is because you know, I can't tour, which is like a huge bummer and a huge part of Ginger Root and, and, you know, the momentum of how we were going. And um, obviously, since we can't do that, I think maybe trying to maybe just write the next record, because I think people, you know, want to hear more music because they can't go see live shows. I think they're consuming more music and trying to be more proactive about live streaming or finding new uh, singles and new records and new artists to listen to as a whole. And so I think, you know, maybe I'll just go and start writing the fourth record or maybe a couple more singles and, and just to keep people interested. Cause I know, I know a lot of people, you know, music has kind of been the thing that's been uh, helping them through this thing that has been going on for so long. So I think, you know, just trying to, you know, keep my head down and, and try to focus on that rather than dwelling. I know a lot of bands are dwelling on like the, what could be if we could be on the road, but I think because I've swallowed that pill, I think I'm finally looking forward to maybe trying to optimize Ginger Root digitally. I don't know what that is yet, but I know that that's something that I've just only recently, like a couple of weeks ago, have realized that maybe it's it's worth my time to do that because that's kind of how it, it is. So um, I think uh, we're going to try to do some live streaming on like the Ginger Root YouTube channel. We did one on Halloween, which was fun. We all dressed up in costumes and and which was great. We had like a lot of people tune in, which was a lot of fun. And we were, we weren't expecting anything. We we're kind of just like, you know, uh, we wanted to just prove, I think to ourselves that we could play all the new songs, you know, together in a live situation. Um, but yeah, we'll probably do one or two more. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't know, I don't know what's really next, but all I know is that 
you know, I'm still having a good time with Ginger Root and I definitely am writing still always and um, it's continuing there. And I think maybe now is a good time to experiment with those plugin suggestions they tell me about. So there, there you, you go. go. If you need any plugin recommendations, I would be more than happy to do it because uh, trust me, Absolutely. When I, whenever I have somebody that does all the, the music stuff in here, we always have a good time talking about plugins. So uh, if Absolutely. people want to keep up with you on social media, how can they do that? Yeah, I'm on everything. Um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok. I make a couple. I do. I actually post a few like just 30 second demos and maybe some short covers on there and people tend to like that. Um, but yeah, and then on YouTube, um, post a lot of stuff on YouTube because uh, Ginger is kind of video centric and um, and uh, yeah, just anywhere you use, probably on there in some capacity. So yes. Heard that, heard that. Well, Cameron, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Before we go, I have one more question for you. So here at Studio 67, I don't know if you've ever seen a Big Bang Radio spotlight before, but um, I'm a musician, but I also love film. I've worked in video editing for quite a, uh, a few years, much like you. Uh, and I, I grew up making short films, um, and I, I continue to work in that, uh, that semi-field uh, to, to this day. And I love film, and I, I, I also feel like musicians have a soft spot for film because it's not too many worlds away from what we do as uh, musical artists. So before we go, what is your favorite movie? I think, you know, it always changes, and that probably happens to you all the time, like you're really into this one director in this movie. I think one that's just so consistent for me and it didn't really do that well but it's just something about it that i really like is be kind rewind um it's uh with with jack black and and moe's death and for those who haven't seen it it's basically they own this vhs rental shop um and one day like jack uh this isn't a spoiler but he like gets magnetized because he's like a crazy guy who like you know like tries to fix things or whatever and he erases all the vhs tapes in the store so what they have to do is they actually start recreating all these famous movies, like super DIY with a VHS camera themselves. And like, I think now thinking about it, that's kind of like the whole idea and the whole vibe of ginger root too. It's just like, you do it all yourself. You, you duct tape things together and see if it works, but you're having a good time as you're doing it. And the music also is great. It's got like stuff by Billy Preston in there and the original score is like super influenced by like Booker T and the MGs. And so um, yeah, Be Kind Rewind with Jack Black and Moe's death, I think is there's that one will always kind of be in my top top movies. Then honorable mention is, is Scott Pilgrim um, versus the world. So that's also a great movie. Thanks to Cameron for sitting down with me and talking all about Ginger Roots music. If you guys want to see more interviews just like this, you can go to Facebook.com slash Studio 67 NCC, YouTube.com slash Nashcom College, or you can find us on Instagram at Studio 67 NCC. Thank you all for watching. I'm Isaac Anderson, and until next time, stay lovely.